Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. Good morning, everyone, and have you ever really stopped to think about what made Adam and Eve happy? <laughs> you know, we all like to be happy. We really, really do. Uh, we sing a song at church sometimes entitled, Sing and Be Happy, and uh, all of us want to uh, experience that exuberance, that zeal, that happiness, that joy, and how do you get it? I want us to think this morning about that first couple in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. Can you imagine? They didn't have anything to worry. They didn't worry about coronavirus. <laughs> they didn't worry about the economy. They didn't worry about not having sports on television. They didn't worry about where their next meal was coming from, for God had made provision for them. But we want to talk about them this morning, and as we reflect upon what made them happy, I think it really uh, is indicative of what the Bible says can make us happy as well. Now, we do thank you for tuning in this morning, and I hope you get your Bible and sit down and, and be ready to study with us as we go along. We're going to call on Joe Hancock right now from Hallsville, Texas, and Joe, I think Probably one of the things that made them happy was the fact that they had an, uh, a fellowship with God, didn't they? Dan, they did. And uh, the one thing that did not make them happy was that fruit. Uh, because of taking the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that fellowship and relationship with God spiritually was severed. You know, can you imagine what it was like for Adam and Eve to walk and, and hear God walking in the garden, to be able to walk and communicate with God in that perfect environment? But that got severed by the partaking of that fruit. Uh, it, we're finding in Genesis chapter 1 at verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God gave man dominion over the rest of creation. He gave man special abilities and capabilities far above those of the animal or plant kingdom. He could think. He had a spirit. He had, he had the ability to, to reason, not unlike God, not on that level of God. But God made man so he, he could have relationship with man, that man could have that fellowship with God there in the garden. In Genesis 3 and verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Now, let's, let's bring everything to, to our day and time. In 1 John chapter 1, the first four verses there, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Uh, John understood that there can still be a relationship with God to those who follow Christ. That relationship through Christ brings us back into fellowship with God. Again, you know, some people think that, that religion is a hamper to their joy. In other words, in order for me to be religious, I, I don't have the joy in doing the things that I would really rather do. Well, that's a mindset. Uh, if my relationship, desire, relationship with God is the way it ought to be in my mind or in my Bible heart, then my joy will come with enhancing that relationship and growing closer to God and having closer fellowship with Him. You know, there was an Old Testament uh, uh, man named Enoch. And in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, we're told, we're told Enoch walked with God. Folks, when, when your life can be said that you walk with God, that your relationship is as it should be with God, 
It doesn't get any better than that. Dan? Thank you, uh, Joe. Thank you very much. You know, when you read this vivid account of their days there in the Garden of Eden, you have to wonder what it was really, really like. Uh, you know, when you stop and think about Adam, you think Eve ever said to Adam, you know what, we're just spending too much time together here in the garden. And uh, maybe you need to go to your man cave somewhere. And uh, someone said that probably if they practiced social distancing that maybe Adam would not have sinned. Now, I don't know all about that, but I know one thing, that we do have fellowship with each other. And, and it was something that really made them happy. I mean, you know, Adam could never have talked about all the women he could have married, nor could Eve uh, talk about anything else but the fact that she was married to this man named Adam. Well, let's go a little bit further here this morning. Let's call on Perry Cowan to talk to us a little bit, Perry, about that fellowship that they had with each other there in the Garden of Eden. Thank you, Dan. Folks, just like Joe was talking about, they, they had fellowship with God. They found it uh, very pleasing and, and bringing happiness to them to have fellowship with other human beings. Well, there was only one other at the beginning, uh, Adam had Eve, Eve had Adam, but actually in the beginning, that fellowship was missing. After God had created all the creatures of all kinds, then he created man in his own image. Now, God said, it's, it's in the book of Genesis, the second chapter, beginning at verse 18, he said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called them uh, was his name. Uh, so Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. Now listen to this part. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God had, uh, caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. He slept and took one of his ribs, closed the flesh up uh, in its place, and then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. They shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. To be truly blessed, to, to achieve the happiness that God would have us to do, we need fellowship with others of our kind. We need fellowship with other human beings. Now, in the Genesis account, this was in relation to marriage, but uh, I'm, I'm going to suggest that uh, it's not limited to that. Uh, events in, in our modern lives push us into contact with more and more people, but, but oftentimes pulls us away from significant relationships. Way too often we pursue happiness at the expense of our relationships rather than as a result of them. We need to focus upon uh, how we can uh, associate with one another to bring happiness in the lives of all that we come in contact with. I, I think all of us would agree that people are more important than things, but do, does our pursuit of happiness show that? It ought to. It's a rare person who on his deathbed does not wish he had spent more time working on quality relationships with other people and less time working for money and things. I wish I'd spent more time with my family is much more commonly heard than I wish I'd have made more money right before we die. Dan? Well, Perry, uh, a tremendous thoughts, and uh, we're so appreciative this morning. You know, when we have all been shut in, so to say, to avoid getting uh, COVID-19 or the coronavirus, uh, we're all reminded of the simplicity of life, the simple things that really bring us joy. You know, I couldn't help but think that when Adam and Eve would walk through that Garden of Eden and they would view as 
really David said in Psalms chapter 19 and verse 1, he said that the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth showeth forth her handiwork, that perhaps maybe they had a realization of just how beautiful it really was. And maybe in years later, they would look back and say, boy, you remember when? We're going to call on Randy Foreman right now to tell us a little bit about that. I'd be happy to, Dan. And by the way, thanks for having me on the program this morning. What a wonderful privilege to have contact with the natural environment of God's creation. In Psalms 111, we have an example of declarative praises uh, that have certain elements that set them apart from other praise psalms. The main difference between these and other declarative praise psalms is that they contain more information as to why the praise is given and what it is about God that draws the praise. Descriptive praise psalms contain the following elements. Number one, a spontaneous expression of hallelujah or praise. For example, praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the company of the upright and in the assembly. Verse 1 of Psalms 111. Then there's a call for others to praise or worship. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, O servants of the Lord. Psalms 135, verse 1. And finally, and then there is the cause for the praise. You know, the main body of the psalm usually sets forth the reasons God is to be praised. The author usually gives a summary statement of the cause for worship, and this usually followed by examples. In Psalms 111, 2 through 6, Scripture records, Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. Splendid and majestic is His work and His righteousness endures forever. He has made His wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He has given food to those who fear Him. He will remember His covenant forever. He has made known to His people the power of His works in giving them the heritage of the nations. You know, in our urban culture, many have less and less contact with nature. But we need contact with nature with the earth, the wind, the water, even with the animals and the plants, with the weather, with soil, things that God created rather than man-made things. There is a joy that comes from being in touch with the environment that God made. It's a source of healing and strength. And, you know, me thinks we neglect it at our own peril. Back to you, Dan. Thank you, Randy. You know, I've often wondered what Adam and Eve ate in that Garden of Eden. You think they walked out into the garden and Adam said, what are we having for supper, Eve? And she said, how about an apple? Or how about an orange? Uh, how about a banana? Uh, we don't know really what they ate, but I can know one thing for sure, and that is God made provision for them. Now, we want to go to uh, Chris Grota right now. Chris, I really believe, uh, honestly, that one of the things that make us happy is work itself. You know, God told them to till the garden. Now, uh, we know how horribly bored we have been just sitting around doing nothing. Well, I hadn't been sitting around doing nothing, but a lot of people are watching television, whatever. And uh, it gets boring. I'd rather be working. I'd rather be doing something, making my time count. And if you've lost your job, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. Chris, go to speak to us to that end. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for tuning in this morning and watching Give Me the Bible. God never gave man anything that wasn't good for him. In fact, uh, the Bible tells us regarding this work that God himself uh, rested on the seventh day from all of his work of creation, Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 2. But then in, two, in chapter 2, verse number 15, it says that God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. So God gave him a work to do as well. God is not anti-work. God is pro-work. Um, we see in the ministry of Jesus Christ, even on the Sabbath day, God was all about doing good for people. Just because he wanted to give man a day of rest doesn't mean you can't take care of your animals when they get into trouble. And certainly it didn't mean that you couldn't take care of people when they got into trouble as well. Jesus healed a lame man on the Sabbath day. And of course, the Jewish leaders got all over him for that. And John chapter 5 and verse number 17, Jesus makes the argument on the Sabbath that my father works and therefore I work. So work is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it is a very good thing. 
And we need to be looking for ways to do the works of God from time to time and day to day. Secondly, I would say the Apostle Paul affirmed that work was a good thing. He said to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 and verse number 35, uh, quotes Jesus when he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. But this expresses a basic principle of our nature as being created beings of God in God's image that we are meant to be happy as a productive and a giving individual. He said in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse number 10, If a man won't work, neither shall he eat. And in Ephesians chapter 4 verse number 28, Paul says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor or work with his hands the thing that is good. Why? So that he may have something to give to a person who is in need. We go back to the Old Testament and we listen to the wisdom of Solomon. There are two classes of people in this world. There are hosts, which are producers, and there are guests, which are consumers. And I would make the argument today that those who are hosts, those who are producers, are the happiest people. Solomon warned, warned in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 9 that he who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. Conversely, he said in Proverbs 22, 29, Do you see a man who excels in his work? He's going to stand before kings. I think about young people today, and there's a lot of parents who aren't teaching their children to work. They want them to have a good self-esteem and a good positive self-image, but they'll never achieve it unless they teach their children to work, and maybe they could teach them by working alongside with them. Ecclesiastes 5.12 says, The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. In Ecclesiastes 2.24, Solomon said, Nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that his soul should enjoy the good in his labor. Therefore also I saw that this was from the hand of God. Back to you, Dan. Chris, thank you very much. You know, the very nature of our relationship to God is that we are servants Think about that just a minute. A servant of God. That involves work, doesn't it? Surely it does. He didn't make us celebrities, but he made us ser servants. Now, we want to go a little bit further here. We're going to call on Jerry Monholland here this morning. And, and Jerry, oddly enough, it is pointed but true that the very thing that made them happy, realistically speaking, was the law of God. They wanted to know what the parameters were, didn't they, Jerry? That's absolutely right. Isn't it wonderful that God does give us boundaries, parameters, knowing what is right and what is wrong, and understanding that, that God does not leave it up to ourselves to determine what is right and what is wrong. And God determines this, and God lets it be known unto, the, unto us. When there in the Garden of Eden, he made it plain unto Adam and Eve and so his word was knowable. It's still knowable today that whenever we, we can read God's law and, and he, he tells us what is right and what is wrong, what, what is good and, and what is evil. And it was not only knowable, he said, you know, of the three of the midst of the garden, you shall not eat. They knew that. Eve understood that. In fact, when that old serpent came along, she repeated. She knew what God's law said. She knew it. It was knowable. It was obeyable also. God did not tell them something uh, to do or to not to do, which was impossible. Oh, they could easily do it. It was knowable. It was obeyable. And so it was only whenever that old serpent came along and, and deceived them and whenever they stopped doing God's law and started listening to the devil that happiness left their life. With God's law, there is order. With God's law, there are parameters of, of right and wrong. We read in the book of Judges, the last verse in the book of Judges, it is, in, the, in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Oh, people would think, oh, that's, that's true happiness. Oh, let me do my own thing. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's not order. That's disorder. That's chaos. Without God, there's chaos in our life, not happiness. I want to go to Psalm 19 and reading about the law of God. It says this, 
The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Isn't that wonderful to see what we have when we have God's law? And conversely, what do we not have if we don't have God's law? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Without God's law, we have no conversion. We are lost completely without reading and, and determining what God says to convert our soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Without the law of God, we, are, we lose wisdom. And thirdly of all, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Without the statutes of the Lord, we have no rejoicing of the heart. Thank you, Jerry. You know, didn't David say, oh, how I love thy law? You know, law's not bad. Laws are good for us. Now, we want to go somewhere a little bit different here in our last segment today. And, you know, what makes you happy? You know, a lot of people talk about happy hour down at the local bar. And if you don't think that's true and that there are a lot of people that rationalize and think that way, one of the very first things that opened up in the state of Texas are local bars. Well, we closed the churches, all right, but we made sure that the bars are open. I'm going to call on my good friend Neil Thurman from over in Tyler right now to maybe deal with a question. Neil, now it's a little bit unusual, but... What would it take to make you happy today? You know, it's a great question, Dan, as we think about it. First, we want to understand as we consider all these things, especially as, as Brother Jerry has just talked about it in the sense of, of God's law, that happiness, our personal happiness, is not our priority. There are more important things because some have used their supposed happiness uh, for a reason to do wicked things. Uh, because they think that God would want them to be happy. But when we consider those things in its proper place of happiness, isn't it interesting, as you just mentioned, that too often we go looking for things that never would have existed in Eden, that place where God created man and woman and set them in a realm of perfection where there should be happiness. It is amazing how they could possibly get by without money or uh, some place to, to shop or the credit card so that they might obtain things in this world. But that seems to be at the base of our problem is that we go seeking happiness in things and we chase after things that are of much less importance and we just don't put the energy into the things that are truly important to make us joyful, the joy that Jesus Christ said he would bring us in John chapter 10 at verse 10, that we might have that abundant life. You consider what the wise man tells us in Proverbs chapter 3 at verse 13, happy is the man who finds wisdom and a man who gains understanding for he proceeds, uh, his proceeds are better than profits of silver and are gained than fine gold. We find in Proverbs 14 at verse 21, he who has mercy on the poor happy as he. So when we think about the things that we are teaching our children and we are having in our own lives that we seek happiness, we need to be finding something that will live on, that will help others, uplift others. Because Dan, when it really comes down to it, when we live like Jesus Christ, one of the greatest things we do is to help others and to do good, and we'll find happiness in that goodness. Back to you, Dan. Well, you're exactly right, Neil, and thank you so much. And we'd like to thank all of our panelists here today for doing such a commendable job and helping us understand what happiness is really all about. You know, too often times, happiness depends upon what happens. And if it doesn't happen the way we want it to happen, then we have no happiness. There's a tremendous difference between joy and happiness. You know, Nehemiah many years ago said that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Every morning when I awaken, I read the Word of God. I open it and I study from its pages and I let the joy of the Lord come into my heart and fill my life. There's a little song that we often sing with young children in Vacation Bible School. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. And you know what? We don't have to let anyone take it away. 
For Jesus said, my joy I give unto you, not as the world gives joy, and no man can take it from you. I'm convinced that when we give up our joy and our happiness and our zeal for God, we'll all have, always have heartache. Thank you so much for watching today. We appreciate your being a part of our telecast, and we hope you'll encourage others to join you next week at this same time right here on this same channel for another presentation of Give Me the Bible. Shadows of the evening fall, sing to 